I'm Elizabeth Esty for the Emergency Medical Minute. Welcome to another edition of the COVID-19 Digest, the podcast where we give you the numbers and look at papers that caught our interest this week. It's May 12th, one day after six new cases of COVID-19 were reported in Wuhan, China, where the outbreak began. These are the first reported cases in Wuhan since April 3rd, and only time will tell whether this is the beginning of a second wave of COVID in China. The city of Wuhan plans to test every one of its 11 million residents over the next 10 days. Globally, we've now reached four and a quarter million confirmed cases of COVID-19, and 291,366 people have died of the disease. The United States now far outpaces all other nations with 82,246 deaths. The UK, France, Italy, and Spain follow the US in total death tolls. Notably, Russia is now second globally in total number of confirmed COVID cases, though it has reported only about 2,100 deaths so far. In Colorado, we have 20,000 and some confirmed cases. 3,000 some hospitalizations and more than 1,000 people have now died of COVID. Particularly hard hit by this outbreak are rural Coloradans. The leading counties in terms of case rates per 100,000 people are Logan County with 2,164 cases per 100,000. Morgan County is second with 1,800 some cases per 100,000. Eagle County is third, Gunnison and Weld Counties trail. Denver County has 583 cases per 100,000 residents. For reasons not fully clear to me, the Emergency Medical Minute is a popular medical podcast in Malaysia, so I wanted to assess the COVID situation there for a moment. Per Hopkins, Malaysia, a nation of 31 million people, now has 6,742 cases and only 109 deaths. Malaysia takes a particularly firm public health stance on COVID. Malaysian authorities have arrested more than 15,000 people for violations of movement control orders in the last month or so. After prison officials objected that jailing violators defeated the infection control purpose of such strict orders, authorities moved toward imposing fines instead. Those who can't pay their fines, though, still go to jail. For 41 Malaysians who had a party, Failure to pay the fine resulted in a six-day after-party in jail. I'll now point out that that death toll in Malaysia is really quite low, at 109 people, and that approximately 23% of Malaysian adults and a whopping 43% of Malaysian adult men smoke. Decades of research have shown that smoking increases both your susceptibility to and severity of all manner of respiratory infections, whether it's the common cold or bacterial pneumonias. So you'd think the world's 1.1 billion smokers would be at particular risk during this pandemic. After all, COVID, at least at first, seemed to be a respiratory virus. What's more, tobacco smoking increases risk for COPD, diabetes, and coronary disease, so may increase risk for more severe COVID indirectly on top of its propensity to cause lung damage. So it's remarkable that preliminary evidence suggests that smokers may be less likely to be harmed by COVID than non-smokers. A story that's gotten a fair amount of attention in the media concerns reports from France that smoking may be protective against COVID. We took a closer look and found that similar reports are coming in from across the globe, including the U.S., and we took some time to look at papers attempting to explain this relationship. In early April, Parisian researchers looked at 11,000 patients hospitalized at public hospitals around Paris and found that only 8.5% of these hospitalized COVID patients were smokers, compared to the 25% of French adults who smoke. A better look at and confirmation of this preliminary hypothesis came also from France in a May 9th preprint of a cross-sectional survey of 482 COVID-positive patients seen at a single Parisian hospital. The French researchers looked at 340 inpatients and 139 outpatients seen in March and the beginning of April. 
They excluded ICU patients from this study as it's very difficult to interview them and get a, a complete smoking history, which is a limitation of the study. Of the hospitalized patients, median age 65, the rate of smoking was only 4.4%. Of those sent home, those with less severe disease, whose median age was 44, only 5.3 of them smoke. Remember, while in the U.S. only about 14% of adults smoke, in France, 40% of adults aged 44 to 53 are smokers, and somewhere between 9 and 11% of those aged 65 to 75 smoke. So these are really dramatic differences. This news spread quickly in France, and government authorities have limited the amount of nicotine patches a person can purchase to a one-month supply. They also intend to test nicotine patches both on patients with COVID and on frontline healthcare workers. The French weren't the first to notice the relative absence of smokers in the COVID wards. One of the first wrapping our head around this disease papers in the New England Journal of Medicine in January noted that while in China, 28% of adults smoke, only 12% of Chinese COVID patients did. A team of Greek researchers looking at uh, Chinese COVID patient data were among the first to notice this oddity about smoking and COVID. They had published a preliminary analysis of five different case series of Chinese patients on March 23rd, where they calculated that the prevalence of smoking in the Chinese COVID patients they looked at was 10.2%, where population-level data suggested that they should have been seeing a rate of smoking in these patients adjusted for age and gender of about 31%. The picture in the U.S. is just emerging, but it's also suggestive of a possible protective effect of smoking. CDC data from a total of 7,162 COVID patients in the U.S. found that only 1.3 were current smokers, and a low smoking prevalence was also observed among hospitalized non-ICU patients, 2.1%, and ICU cases, where only 1.1% of patients were smokers. Remember that the population smoking prevalence in the U.S. is 13.8%. A JAMA network case series of 5,700 patients hospitalized with COVID in the New York City area found that 84% of these patients had never smoked. This a study doesn't give numbers on the percentage of patients who were current smokers, so we just don't know. But since 14% of New Yorkers smoke, it's likely that smokers also in this case series were underrepresented compared to the general population or the population of New York. The Greek researchers expanded their analysis to include almost 6,000 patients from China and found that only 450 of them smoked. Across the 13 studies they looked at, the prevalence of smoking ranged from just 1.4% to 12.6%, and the pooled prevalence of current smoking was only 6.5% in a country where a quarter of adults and half of all men are smokers. The authors note that while they could not guarantee that there were no confounding factors, the findings of low smoking prevalence were consistent across all 13 studies, which were from different regions in China and different hospitals. The authors note that in this research, they did look only at hospitalized patients, so couldn't draw any conclusions about smokers with milder disease that was managed outpatient. Their data also didn't allow any conclusion on whether smoking contributed to worse outcomes. One of the most perplexing studies we came across was a paper published in the journal Nicotine and Tobacco Research on the 3rd of April. It's looking also at six studies out of China, including some of the same ones that the Greek researchers looked at. And it's remarkable for confirming the unexpectedly low percentage of smokers that appear in studies of COVID. The authors seem almost blind to the data they themselves present. They've got a table showing rates of smoking in COVID patients that are just remarkably low across the board in all six studies. Despite this, they seem determined to latch on to modifying what they call avoidable host factors such as smoking as an important way to address the COVID epidemic. They're clearly approaching this topic from a public health and preventive medicine point of view, which is great. And they go on to stress that quarantine can be a great time to stop smoking, though they do acknowledge that isolation and mental distress, what they call mental distress, increase rates of smoking. They suggest, quote, 
that ongoing public health campaigns should include reference to the importance of smoking cessation during the pandemic and call for large-scale interventions to help people quit. They then say, we need stronger evidence about the association of smoking with COVID-19. This is kind of rich because in the month since, we seem to be accruing this, quote, stronger evidence, unquote, but it's just a complete surprise that the association goes in the wrong direction or the unexpected direction, I should say. Of course, this is a correlation. And now we can all chant together that correlation doesn't imply causation. But when correlation is this strong, it's worth a deeper look. There are hundreds of chemical compounds in tobacco smoke, but researchers are looking first at nicotine for an explanation of the effect they're seeing epidemiologically. There are two theories with some biologic plausibility. One is that nicotine might somehow block the virus from entering cells via its impact on ACE2 receptor concentrations. You may remember we did an episode a few weeks ago on uh, ACE2 and NSAIDs and COVID. The other idea is that nicotine might dampen the cytokine storm effect found in the worst cases of COVID. An April 30 editorial by the same group of Greek researchers we referred to earlier in Toxicology Reports takes a deep dive into why smokers appear to be protected from COVID. I'm being a little vague, I know, here with the word protected. As of now, the data just isn't there to hone in on whether smokers are protected against getting infected in the first place, or whether they're less likely to be symptomatic, or whether they are protected from severe disease. You'd think smokers might be more apt to be exposed, given that they touch objects and touch their faces and mucous membranes more than non-smokers. It may be that infected smokers are less likely to develop symptoms, or if they do, they're more likely to have mild symptoms, stay at home, and just not show up in statistics. Or maybe it really is harder for the SARS-CoV-2 virus to get a foothold in smokers. Anyway, the Greek researchers sketch out some of the ways in which they think the cholinergic nervous system modifies and controls the inflammatory response. You may or may not remember that the cholinergic system is that collection of nerves and brain tissue that use acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. For our purposes, you can think of it as basically synonymous with the parasympathetic nervous system. It's that branch of the autonomic system that contracts smooth muscle, dilates blood vessels, increases bodily secretions, slows your heart rate. Basically, the system at work when you're not being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. Nicotine attaches to and activates the cholinergic receptors in this system. It's a central relaxant. The big idea that these authors are trying to get across is that the immune system and the nervous system communicate with each other. The nervous system, they're saying, can ramp up or tamp down a cytokine storm. They describe animal studies where if you cut the vagus nerve, that's one of those main anatomical parts of the parasympathetic system, a mouse is way more likely to have a cytokine storm if you expose it to a toxin. On the other hand, if you gently stimulate the vagus nerve electrically, you can kind of put out the fire on a cytokine storm. So the authors are saying that the central nervous system modulates both inflammatory and immune responses via the nervous system, with communication going both ways, brain to body, body to brain, and much of it conducted through the vagus nerve. This nervous immune communication, like most things nervy, is quick. It's much faster than the anti-inflammatory, inflammatory inflammatory balance of responses that are mediated by circulating proteins in our blood. The authors here make some really sweeping claims. They say that nicotine could maintain or restore the function of the cholinergic anti-inflammatory system and thus control the release and activity of pro-inflammatory cytokines. This, they say, could prevent or suppress the cytokine storm. That's a bold claim, of course, but one that's really amenable to study. They undercut their claims a little bit when they go off onto some real tangents. They do touch on a topic we've discussed earlier, the idea that SARS-CoV-2 might be neuroinvasive. They speculate the direct viral invasion of the vagus nerve could lead to ACE2 downregulation, prompting a dysregulated immune response. They go way deeper down a rabbit hole in an interesting discussion 
of the ways in which nicotine seems to be protective against the loss of sense of smell that's very commonly seen in Parkinson's disease. Then they go off onto a whole nother tangent, speculating that although SARS-CoV-2 seems to have originated from a bat coronavirus, it may have recombined with a snake coronavirus RNA, where, I guess the implication is, the virus picked up a little snake venom code. They compare protein sequences between SARS-CoV-2 and snake venom neurotoxins and find areas with four or five amino acid long areas of homology. They note that these little snake venom-like stretches of SARS-CoV-2 might account for some of the mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 damage, pointing out that many snake venoms are acetylcholine antagonists. Remember, nicotine is a cholinergic agonist, so kind of like the opposite of snake venom. This is getting pretty wildly speculative, but the researchers do circle back to Earth, noting that it is clear that nicotine is a cholinergic agonist and an inhibitor of pro-inflammatory cytokines. We know from animal models that nicotine inhibits tumor necrosis factor, TNF, and interleukins 1 and 6, among other cytokines. In mice, this is how nicotine is speculated to protect against ARDS. Clinical trials are underway already for anti-IL-6 and anti-TNF medications in COVID. But the Greek authors speculate that it might be more effective to in inhibit several interleukins instead of just targeting one, noting that anti-IL-6 drugs really do have some nasty side effects. By controlling the inflammatory system via stimulating the cholinergic system with nicotine, the authors speculate that nicotine might be able to balance the immune response to viral infection. So what are the chances that nicotine could prevent infection or reduce the severity of COVID infection? There are a lot of ifs here, but it's an intriguing possibility. Rates of e-cigarette use and nicotine patches are fairly low in Chinese and French uh, populations overall, and we don't have any indication that they were in wide use in the patients studied in the research described above. Perhaps we'll get more data from U.S. patients who vape nicotine products or who are using nicotine patches or gum, and of course from the studies now planned or underway. The French authors speculate that patients who do abruptly stop nicotine use when they're hospitalized, as so many smokers do when they're hospitalized, might actually do worse. So it seems reasonable to replace nicotine in these patients. Finally, I just want to marvel at how odd and ironic it would be if in our scramble to repurpose existing drugs, one indirectly responsible for millions of deaths every year was the drug that could save lives. We are on a quest to provide the world with free medical education. Please help us out by rating us on iTunes, following us on social media, and subscribing to our newsletter at emergencymedicalminute.com.